Take a look at this scene from a relatively unheard of show. Now look at this scene from a high profile anime movie. What do both of these clips have in common? You might have guessed the answer already but yes, both these clips belong to shows produced by Studio Ufotable. Believe it or not, Ufotable shows used to look very different a decade and a half back. The studio was all about experimentation back then. So when did Ufotable productions go from this? to this? Well, the answer is Kara no Kyokai. Kara no Kyokai or The Garden of Sinners is a 7 movie long series, 9 if you count the future gospel flicks. It was the first ufotable show that looked like a ufotable show. Kara no Kyokai perfectly captures both the soul of the Nasuverse and ufotable's animation philosophies. But before we talk about it, we need to look at the early days of ufotable. The studio had a unique way of operating, focusing on on experimentation and in-house production. In fact, none of the episodes from the first proper Ufotable show were outsourced, despite the fact that the show was produced a mere three years after the formation of the studio. Even with a staff of less than 35 people, the studio relied heavily on in-house talent, a bold decision to say the least. The small but incredibly talented group of people who formed the studio and founder Hikaru Kondo's sky is the limit attitude helped the studio get to where it is today. Even before Kara no Kyokai was a thing, names such as Go Kimura, Akira Matsushima, Haruo Sotozaki and more had gravitated towards the studio. These names are still heavily involved with ufotable shows. The studio was always up for a challenge, and not in a modern MAPA-like manner. Despite undertaking challenging projects, Ufotable management had a keen interest in producing shows in-house. Instead of simply hiring a bunch of people and brute forcing their way through poorly planned projects, they picked their shows carefully, creating a diverse catalogue and executing them with a respectable degree of smoothness. They let their creativity face challenges instead of their management. And that brings us to Kara no Kyokai, a perfect example of the studio never shying away from a challenge. Fun fact, Kara no Kyokai was originally supposed to be a trilogy of short movies, roughly 40 minutes in length, airing once a month. But it somehow morphed into a 7 movie long series, with two of them crossing the 2 hour mark. The interval between releases naturally increased as well. Ufotable and studio founder Hikaru Kondo's ambition knew no bounds. By the way, the studio originally intended to release all seven movies in seven months. An idea that, while obviously being absurd, gave us a look at the thought process behind the scenes. The studio challenged the norms established within the industry. Unorthodox direction structures, heavy reliance on in-house anime production, etc. etc. In fact, each Kara no Kyokai movie had a different director and each director was allowed to do their own thing. They didn't assign a chief director to supervise each individual director. These names, some of whom had very little directorial experience at the time, were allowed to present the story in their own ways. That was their production model. In fact, that's where the name Ufotable comes from, a round table that everyone, regardless of their standing in the industry, can sit around and share their ideas. Even back then, the studio had made significant progress with their in-house animation, color and compositing departments. This of course improved the amount of communication between each department, making the final product more cohesive. This is an aspect the studio prioritized. Even in the current industry filled with heavily fragmented productions, Ufotable continues to nurture a strong in-house culture. So creative freedom, healthy productions and a strong in-house culture made Kara no Kyokai special. That's true, but there's something missing. Something, or rather someone, who would change the way Ufotable shows look. Someone who helped shape that iconic Ufotable style. That's right, director of photography Yuichi Terao was allowed to do his own thing with Kara no Kyokai. Terao is the current head of Ufotable's digital team. He was the last piece of the puzzle. With him on board, Kara no Kyokai hit the big screen, and it was beautiful. Hauntingly so. The series looked very different. The out there compositing was the most noticeable aspect, in a good way of course, but it wasn't the only one. The direction, the style of presentation, the art direction, Yuki Kajiura's haunting soundtrack, it truly was an insane audiovisual experience. 
Cardano Kyokai was essentially a prototype. It was a building block that led to the current nearly flawless style that the studio is known for. Animation-wise, it was a lot more traditional than usual. You can find plenty of Sakuga-isms throughout all seven movies. But make no mistake, this was still a ufotable project. Grand cinematic staging, dynamic CGI edit camera work and tracking shots, strong compositing choices and digital additions, this series had it all. The first movie, directed by A. Aoki, was the perfect start. Aoki relied heavily on camera work and compositing tricks. The compositing itself was fascinating. Of course, it wasn't flawless. In fact, it was experimental. A general shine could be seen throughout the nighttime scenes, with strong shades of blue, green, and yellow. While the compositing had plenty of highlights, it did have its issues, although none of them were too significant. Some of the lighting felt inorganic, the execution of the motion blurs wasn't that good, but overall, it was an an amazing way of presenting a show. Every aspect worked. The art direction conveyed that urban horror vibe perfectly. The direction and storyboards kept up with this vibe, with long, lingering shots which added a sense of uncanniness. The iconic rooftop fight was the highlight. A grand stage, sweeping camera work, beautiful backgrounds, wonderful animation, and nearly flawless compositing. It was amazing. The fight demonstrated the perfect synergy between the photorealism and the more traditional anime-like aspects. This vivid facial expression animated by Nozomu Abe, for example. The second movie, directed by Takuya Nonoka, was a proper horror flick. It didn't feature any real action. Instead, it allowed the atmosphere to shine. It wasn't that different from the first movie in terms of direction. Lingering shots, beautiful, well-lit, yet cold backgrounds, just the right amount of grotesque visuals, you get the idea. For a movie that almost entirely consists of dialogue, this was riveting. Despite being the second movie, it was the first one to enter production, and it's extremely competent on all fronts. While the first movie established a sense of mystery, this one established a sense of horror. The third movie, directed by Mitsuru Obunai, was a bit different. Obunai was primarily an animator and had very little experience with direction, and the movie was created accordingly. It toned down the density of the storyboards. Of course, it was still wonderfully directed, but you get my point. The final fight was a lot more anime-like, if that makes sense, with wonderful drawings and energetic character arcs. Given how matured this movie was content-wise, I wished the direction was a bit more complex. But that's just the standards set by this series. The fourth movie, directed by Teichi Takiguchi, was similar in its own way. Takiguchi was primarily an animator as well, and his skill set affected the movie in a good way, that is. He, just like Obunai, served as an animator and animation director. Takiguchi drew the layouts for a whopping 300 out of the 470 cuts and the Genga for 180 cuts. He effectively animated two-thirds of the movie himself, and he prioritized the more foundational, weight-filled style of character animation. The disturbingly lifelike animation worked hand-in-hand -hand with the compositing and the overall story. The fifth movie, directed by Takayuki Hirao, is the the best this series has to offer, in my opinion. It's very difficult to do it justice using words alone. This movie was the definition of the word experimental. It used the atmosphere that was carefully crafted up until this point to its advantage. It sped things up and leaned into the mystery aspect. Abstract visual choices, coupled with a wonderfully crafted set piece that was the apartment complex, made for an insane viewing experience. The movie had plenty of action. Tetsuya Takeuchi storyboarded and animated several minutes worth of hand-to-hand -hand combat. This apartment fight is still one of my favorite anime fights from a visual point of view. It also featured that iconic Gokimura cut, one which would serve as the foundation for the dynamic camera work that Ufotable is known for. A brilliant production all around. The sixth movie, directed by Takahiro Miura, was a lot more light-hearted, and the visuals conveyed that. Miura was a key figure in the Heavensfield franchise, and KNK6 gave us an early glimpse at that style, relying on a more spectacle-heavy presentation. The fight near the end of this movie looked stunning, with amazing short compositions and a large amount of competency displayed by the photography team. The seventh movie was directed by Shinsuke Takizawa, and if that name doesn't ring a bell, it's because he doesn't actually exist. 
Shinsuke Takizawa is a pen name. The movie actually needed five different directors, and this wasn't a creative decision. It was something they had to do out of necessity. Like I said, the original plan was to produce three 40-minute long movies. Despite being organized, the jump from a 120 minutes of content to over 500 minutes proved to be a bit much for the studio. As a result, the movie was a bit disjointed. But the way I see it, it was a culmination of every style we had seen up until that point. The camera work oriented approach and the animation oriented approach. This movie had both. It looked amazing. The 8th installment slash epilogue deserves a few words as well. The entire 30 plus minute long episode consists of a single conversation taking place in a single location but it's one of the most compelling things ever. Kara no Kyokai is not for everyone but I do recommend checking it out. It's a fascinating experience. KNK is a prototype of both Kinokonasu's writing and Ufotable's visuals. It's the show that shaped the current Ufotable style. A style the studio has perfected by this point. That's about it. Did you like this video? Check out this other bit of content on screen if you did. Make sure to like and subscribe and until next time.